So we will start in a few minutes. As I can see, people are just joining now. I think maybe we can start within a minute. Okay. I think we can make a start. So hello everyone and welcome to this webinar brought to you by Mercy and Western Cheshire Local Network. This session is organized by Biomedical Engineering Group, and um, it will be hosted by myself, Ashkan Eliasi, and my colleague, Dr. Andrew Caldos. So the aim of the group is to raise awareness and further knowledge in this multidisciplinary field, support the industry to advance through networking opportunities, connect individuals, give voice to active individuals and share knowledge. So this group was recently established and um, we are looking for volunteers to join us in the steering committee. If you are interested to join, we are asking for no more than five minutes of your time per month and benefits, some benefits can include influence in the direction and activities of our group, extensive networking opportunities, support for CN registration, and it will be a valuable addition to your CV. So if anyone is interested to join, please drop me an email and I can provide you more information. So today's event, uh, the title for today's event is From Skin and Bones to Sport Equipment, 3D Testing Using Optical Metrology. So speakers for today's sessions are Amy Johnson and Robert Wood from GOM UK LTD. So Amy is an application engineer specializing in supporting GOM UK's customers with their testing application. She has a degree in physics from Oxford University, but has since worked within aerospace industry. So through her work with GOM UK, she has supported customers from a wide range of industries, including automotive, aerospace, medical, sports apparel and academic sector. Rob is a UK sales engineer for GOM's optical measurement systems. He has a degree in automotive engineering from Loughborough University. He has over 15 years experience in a testing and evaluation environment, including more than 10 years working in optical measurements. This work has spanned many sectors, including automotive, aerospace, marine, medical, nuclear, civil, and academic. So today's session, uh, the presentation will take roughly 40 to 45 minutes. Uh, it will be followed by Q&A session. And uh, please use the Q&A box to post your questions as we go through the presentation. The session is recorded and it will be available within a few days on YouTube and on our website at the IET. CPD certificates will be provided on request. Please, if you need one, uh, contact either myself or uh, Andrew Caldos to provide you with the certificate. And finally, on behalf of Mercy and Western Cheshire Local Network, I would like to encourage you to come to events, join a group and involve your company. There are a number of people you could contact to learn more about our activities or get involved in our activities. You could contact myself. I'm the chair of Biomedical Engineering Group. 
Andrew Caldos is the chair of management and manufacturing group. Rob McDonald, who is the local ne local network chair, and Godfrey Evans, who is a local network deputy chair. So, without further ado, I would like to pass on to Rob to start uh, his presentation. Yeah, perfect. Just while I share the screen, so thank you for the introduction, Ashkan, and thank you for the invitation to speak today as well. Hopefully, uh, your members will will find it useful and interesting. So. As you mentioned, the, the title of our presentation is From Skin and Bones to Sports Equipment, 3D Testing Using Optical Metrology. So to start off with, just to put a couple of photos to our names, if you can't see our web, um, webcams, um, yeah, my name's Rob Wood. You can, if you can see our webcam, you'll also see I've got le less hair in real life than in the photo. And I'm joined by my colleague today, Amy. Hi everyone, I'm Amy. So we're based out of the GOM UK office, which is um, in Coventry. And there, there's just over 20 of us supporting the sales and support of our optical measuring systems for the UK and the Irish market. So a little bit of an overview about what we're going to talk, um, talk about today. So we're going to start with a summary and then we're going to go into applications, including sports apparel, surgical techniques, some tissue applications, prosthetics and implants, and then ending on some sports equipment. So the world of 3D testing is, is what we call this. And typically for us, 3D testing involves a, um, an optical sensor like you see here. This is one of our Aramis sensors. So essentially it's two cameras um, and a light. So the cameras are separated by an angle and um, a distance between them. So if I run this video, this shows the, the Aramis sensor in a materials testing setup. So a much smaller field of view. So looking maybe at a hundred mil field of view here. So you see two cameras with an angle between them. The two cameras allows us to measure in 3D. We then need some information on the surface. And in this case, that's where that speckle pattern comes in. So essentially we can track the movement in 3D of all of those small little dots, and we can uh, generate a full field strain map like we see here. So this is showing the deformation of the test. We, it can be used to look at local behavior, such as for example, the Luder strain bands you see forming here on the transition between the elastic and the plastic regions or for um, ultimate failure. So here you can get a real idea of the ultimate failure strain in this materials test. So we're talking a 100% plus, which is obviously useful for biomechanical objects where you could go up to thousands of percent strain. So the same system, can be used in this bigger configuration that you see here. So um, this is looking at just a larger area and it's also, instead of tracking the speckle pattern, we're tracking these discrete point markers that you see on the surface. And here we're just using the same setup to look at the sort of the six degree of freedom interaction between the, the door and the chassis and specifically for this door slam event, um, looking at the protrusion of the door into the chassis, looking at the velocities and really understanding how, how the component is perform, uh, performing. So today, though, we want to focus on the use within biomechanics testing applications. So a little bit of the advantages. So obviously, you've seen a video. Maybe you can see some of the advantages there for yourself. Um, the big one is that it's non-contact. And this is really important for biomechanical um, testing, especially when we think of things uh, such as uh, light structures, like tissues, for example, where we don't want to be sticking anything um, heavy or weighty to the surface. Although it's non-contact, it's still very high precision. So we can detect some really um, small levels, micro motions of movement. And this is also useful for the, um, the sorts of applications we're gonna present today. Um, other things, so although there might be very li limited movement, you can also imagine there's some quite complex motions going on with uh, more natural um, structures rather than more typical structures that we see in automotive or aerospace example. So we can really look at that complex motion, the six degree of freedom analysis, uh, relative motion between different components. And really it can be used for any type of test as well. So for um, ultimate load tests or for long-term fatigue tests. So as I mentioned, and we've seen in the video, there's two different modes of operation or two different ways it can track and generate data all from the same system. So the top one is um, that speckle paint that we've seen on the materials. Um, samples. So this is based on the technique of digital image correlation. So it's an area-based full field um, data analysis. And the other one, the lower one, is 3D motion analysis using these 
um, point-wise inspections. Typically here, we're just looking at displacements and velocities, and you would see the results in the, the vector form that you see in the image as well. Okay, so to start with, um, hopefully an application we can all relate to uh, in footwear. So Adidas are a very large user of Aramis across their um, uh, worldwide R&D facilities. So here's an example from the internet of some of the promotional shots they've used, um, showing the use of Aramis in the development of running shoes. Essentially though, what they're looking to do is start by modeling what happens to the feet um, or a barefooted um, foot, if that makes sense, when um, you're starting to run. So for example here, they know that the, the skin has the maximum area of strain or major strain, in its extended um, state in the talus region in uh, indicated on the image on the left, just before the contact end. So as, as the toes are pushing off there. And at the opposite end, the, the area of minor strain or compressive strain is in that same talus area where you've got maximum contact between the foot and the floor. So there's a couple of just static images. We can also look at that dynamically this time from above. So you can see the, um, a dynamic video of the impact. So here and in the graphs, we're looking at the strain in between each of the individual pairs of toes. Another way we could look at that is in terms of the strain tensor directions as well. So this can really understand load paths and where strain is progressing and moving throughout a structure, or in this case, throughout the skin. Ultimately, though, they're using this information on the barefoot to allow them to design shoes. Um, after, once they've designed the shoes as well, they can repeat the same measurements, but instead of on the barefoot, they can um, uh, do the measurement on the actual shoe itself, as you see in this video. Um, the goal here is that they want a shoe to, um, to provide the support you need for running, but also uh, while you're moving, you it doesn't want to restrict you. So it wants to have the same movements as if you were running barefoot, but with the support of a running shoe. One of the more recent shoes that they launched was the Alpha Bounce shoe. Um, and here Adidas used the Aramis a lot in the promotion and the build up to the launch of this shoe. And in fact, that their marketing launch in um, a New York warehouse, they had the, the shoes being worn by professional athletes and they were running in, in front of an Aramis camera system and uh, showing the, the strains in the shoe live on the screen. In fact, they liked it so much in the speckle pattern that they actually released a, a limited edition Alpha Bounce Aramis shoe. So this pattern is actually not applied to the shoe. This is part of the design of the shoe. So they like the, the look of the uh, speckle pattern so much that they released this uh, uh, yeah, Alpha Bounce Aramis shoe. So this is, um, a video one of our German engineers took with him running in his pair of uh, RMS running shoes. So they also use it for uh, many other applications. One of them that we can show is in clothing. So this is a, a running vest and it's designed to support the muscle in a particular way. Um, you can see quite an interesting pattern of strain there. Um, the idea here was that they wanted to correlate with the FEA. So many of our our customers are, are comparing RMS results to FEA or finite element analysis models. So just visually, they, they obviously look very similar. So we get this comment all the time, it is this simulation data and it's not. So what you see on the left-hand side of the screen here is the running vest with the speckle pattern applied and the strain field that you see is the real actual test um, measurement. And on the right-hand side, we've got the simulation so you can just visually compare the two and see some correlation and of course we've got some much more detailed algorithms for allowing you to compare the two um, at a much better resolution okay now i want to move on and, and change to more surgical techniques so the uh, the latter jet is a procedure to treat uh, recurring shoulder dislocations. So uh, the shoulder dislocation is the most common dislocation of the biggest joints uh, typically caused either by um, a trauma injury or through a habitual dislocation. So there's many different ways or fixation methods that can be um, applied in this procedure. So you see just some of them uh, listed on the screen here. Essentially, there was a, a series of work that was done using the RMS system to understand which of these uh, fixation methods was the best. 
Um, by the best, we mean the one that induces least deformation or least movement in the structure. So today we're just going to focus on the two screw method, which you see highlighted um, on the screen now. Just to help us visualize and understand um, a little bit more about what's going on in the test, we actually use one of our ATOS um, scanning systems. So this is a structured light or fringe pattern scanner, which is the other side of GOM's business. Um, so this system allows you to scan the actual model and you could compare this back to CAD typically for quality control or in this case, use it for the visualization um, of the test. So you see in this image here how we allow that, that detailed scan of the shoulder and all the bone sections to allow us to visualize where we are um, with our test data down here. So in a minute, you'll see a, a very zoomed in video of this local region, but having that scan data all around allows us to visualize really what's going on um, in the measurement. So as promised, here's the video of the, the test. So this is from one of the cameras. You'll see that we're making use of both the DRC, digital image correlation speckle pattern, and the discrete marker points for doing the 3D motion analysis. Uh, in this case, we've got the punch at the top of the, um, the test applying the load to the fixation method. And you can see that it's a cyclic load in until ultimate failure. Just let it fail again. There it is. So the, um, that overall location, we can zoom in, you can see we can overlay the image that we've taken there. And you can see the area in yellow is um, the area on the bone material where we've applied the DIC pattern to do our full field strain analysis. We've also applied a number of um, marker points, which are shown here in purple on the left hand side. These are used for what we call rigid body motion compensation. So in this particular test, everything is moving. Um, so what we want is the relative motion between the screws and the fixation and the, um, the shoulder itself. So we want to essentially remove that movement of the shoulder. So this is our rigid body motion. So we can subtract the movement of the shoulder as if, um, as if that was zero. So we can do that um, in the software. Other points that we apply, as well as the purple ones for the motion compensation, the red points that you see here were used for um, tracking the motion of the two individual screws. And then finally, the yellow points were used for um, tracking the motion of the, the stamp or the punch. So the stamp or the punch is essentially our boundary conditions that we're applying the load um, to the structure or to the setup. So first of all, looking at the strain analysis, on the surface of the bone, you see as the video runs through um, the full field surface strain, and you see that there's a concentration on the left hand side, which is actually the left upper left of this image here, and it increases through the color range. So blue is lower, red is higher, and it um, increases to red just before failure. Now obviously, we can investigate that a little bit more, and that's one of the benefits of, um, of a full field technique like this. With a strain gauge, you would stick it on um, before the test, maybe, for example, you would stick it here. And that's not actually the area of, major, of the maximum strain. So after the test, we can see that the, the area of maximum strain is this 0.2 here, um, which is just by the left screw. And this is represented by the green graph that you see on the graphs on the right hand side. And you can see clearly that this has the higher amount of strain compared to the 0.1, which is on the opposite side and the blue one in this graph. The other thing that the, the lower graph shows is that we've been able to sync this data up. So this strain data can be synced up with the um, with whatever else is going on in our test environment. So in this case, the load or craft in German is um, exported via uh, an analog signal. So when we record images, we also sample the analog um, input channels so we can sync everything up within the software and we can do some further analysis if needed. And just like the running shoe, we can also visualize the strain directions as well to help um, understand the load paths. So here, for example, the loading is coming in from the right hand side where you see the arrow. And we've got a compressive um, load direction at that loading point, and then it, it changes to failure around the tension um, location on the, uh, the green side up around here. We can then use the point markers as well, just specifically to look at the six degree of freedom analysis of the two screws. So 
purely then look at the motion analysis of these screws and we can set the coordinates so that we're looking for rotations around the, the z direction so in this case it's the direction of these um, these blue arrows so it's in this circular sort of in plane direction that we're looking at how the screws move so in this example um, both screws actually rotate in opposite directions so you can see this from the, the upper graphs so of the blues going up as the black is going down. So they're um, rotating away from each other, which is, is, um, is what we want. So the left screw is actually, just to confuse things, the left screw is actually the upper one and this one and the right one is uh, the lower screw here. So we can see that the, um, the left screw has the lower level of rotation. So this is the black one in the graph here, while the right or the lower one has the larger level of um, strain. And you can see that this level is actually, or the, um, the value of this strain is actually slightly increasing through the test. But more interestingly, what you can see is that there's a gap developing here between um, the movements of the screw. So this is indicating that the screw is actually loosening. So the right-hand screw is actually loosening a bit, which is obviously not great. Okay, moving on to another surgical technique. So now we want to talk about a uh, tibia nail system. So again, like the, um, the previous example, there's different designs available for different fixation methods. Um, here, we're, we're gonna run a test to look at those small micro motions in the gap between where the fixations have occurred. And it really is a, a balancing act here. So um, we need, uh, we need enough movement for healing, but not too much movement. So to, if we get too few a move, movement, then there's no, no, uh, no bone neoplasma generated. If we get too much movement, then this newly developed bone material will not ossify or be solid enough. So in the test here, you see a video on the right-hand side of the test in operation. So we have a femur at the top applying load through to our artificial tibia. The bone has been prepared with a, an unstable metaphysical fracture and the, um, the force of the test has also been, been recorded in the same way um, I explained previously. So you can see it's a cyclic test, but with increasing force um, or increasing load as we go through the test. Again, we can use different components. So um, in the, the red, we have the, the femur point at the top. The, um, the purple points towards the distal end of the tibia and the turquoise points at the proximal end um, up here. So we can also use the points to help us set coordinate systems and alignments as well. So um, where the tibia fixes into this cylinder at the bottom, we can put a number of points around this cylinder. So the black points you see on the image here. So these can be used to define a cylinder and that cylinder can define our, our Z axes in this case, uh, represented by the blue arrow there. So that's along the longitudinal length or axes of the bone. If we zoom in now to look at the upper part and look at these motions. It, it, Looks quite big at the moment, but uh, when you start to look at the, um, the scales on the next graph, you understand that it is actually quite a small level of movement. And what we've been able to do is apply two gauges, point to point distances, one on each side of the, the gap. And then we can look at the length changes between those two gaps. So plotting that in terms of the graph, um, we see what we expect, but the, the turquoise is um, the, uh, the larger gap on this side. So here, the, um, the initial length is shrinking, while on the opposite side, the purple one, the, um, the gap is increasing. And you can see the, the sorts of levels. So we're talking um, sort of tenths of a millimeter, 0.1 of a millimeter uh, movements that we're measuring in this particular setup. Of course, we can also look at the six degree of freedom analysis again. So here we can look at the rotation of the lower compared to the upper segment. And again, if we um, look at the graphs here, so we can look at the full six degree of freedom, if you don't know what that is. So the six degrees are the, the three translations in X, Y, Z and the rotations about those three axes. So this graph is plotting just the rotation segment um, around the three axes. So you can see the um, rotations around the blue axes, which is the Z axes are very small and can be neglected. The largest is actually around the red X axes and the, uh, the next one and this considerable one in that is around the Y 
um, axes shown in green in this case. Okay, and then finally, just from that same test as well, we can look at bending induced by the tibia as well. So again, really small scales, but you can see that in the center of the bone, we've got around um, 30 microns, 35 microns of movement in this um, horizontal or X direction, while at the other ends, um, we've got um, sort of about 20, 25 microns in the opposite direction. So we're seeing the bending uh, across the, um, the tibia at the moment. Okay, so at this point, I'm going to hand over to Amy. So uh, as a person that a couple of years ago had a, a disc protrusion, this next application um, makes me feel a bit funny. So I'm going to hand over to Amy at this point. Uh, thanks for that, um, Rob, and thanks for introducing uh, some of the concepts that we're going to talk about. So we're going to continue with a few more um, sort of surgical technique applications, and then we'll move on to a few more about sort of sports equipment. So um, now we're going to look at the motion analysis of the spines. So the goal is to look at the motion analysis of an intact spine uh, using Aramis, of course, and then the future goal would be any other spines that are looked at with uh, damage or that have had replacement vertebrae, the stiffness could be compared back to this uh, intact spine section to analyze any differences in the stiffness. So um, here's a video of the test. You've got the top vertebrae um, here encased in epoxy resin and the bottom vertebrae as well. And the test machine is used to stimulate. Um, sorry, uh, sorry to interrupt. I think you need to share your screen. Oh. Yeah, sorry. I don't think I'm seeing that. I was struggling to find the button. To... How's that? Perfect, thank you. Yeah, yeah nice. sorry. <laughs> on, um, yeah. on WebEx, it, you don't have to click twice. Zoom, you have to click twice, sorry. Um, hopefully everyone can see the spine section uh, yeah. now. Cool. So to prepare the part, we applied um, reference points to some pins. These pins are actually applied uh, into the vertebrae and then we applied these reference points to both the pins and the uh, soft tissue surrounding the vertebrae. So the idea is these pins will move uh, rigidly with the, um, with the vertebrae. So we can work out what the movement of each vertebrae is based on the movement of these pins. The, um, all of the points have been grouped together to form uh, point components and vertebrae five at the bottom has been uh, used as the rigid body motion compensation points. So we'll be looking at all of the displacements relative to vertebrae five. The vertebrae was scanned using a CT scanner. So each of the vertebrae is its own individual uh, mesh. These are then what can be tacked to the points that are attached to the pins. Um, and we can also use the CT scan data, uh, the cylindrical section at the bottom, to provide an alignment as well. So here's a video of the results. Um, as I said before, the bottom vertebrae five is used um, as the rigid body motion compensation. And of course, the top vertebrae up here, vertebrae one, is the one that's moving the maximum amount. So we've got almost 40 millimeters uh, of movement in each direction relative to vertebrae five. But of course the global movement is a lot larger and it is possible to measure such large and small movements with the Aramis system. So looking at the CT data and the, you know, the how we can use this CD data to help us uh, visualize what's happening during the test. Um, in this video, we can see how vertebrae two moves relative to uh, vertebrae one, the one that's in the epoxy resin up here. Um, then we, the researchers were particularly interested in the ro relative rotations of each of the, these two vertebrae. So these can be measured and then plotted on a graph within the GOM software. So 
there's a small local coordinate system that's tacked to the points for each of the vertebrae and these rotations are um, measured on the graph for each cycle. So the black line represents vertebrae one, which is rotating um, over 20 degrees. This is relative to vertebrae five at the bottom. And then the yellow line represents ver the rotations of vertebrae two. The red line uh, represents the relative um, rotations between the two vertebrae. So we've got about five degrees um, of rotation between vertebrae one and vertebrae two um, throughout this test. So looking at the sort of analysis we can do thanks to having the CT scan data in this project as well. Um, so not only does it look really great, it really helps um, people to understand what's going on during the test, we can also check for the vertebrae disc thickness, but dynamically through the test. So if we look at this in more detail, so the vertebrae disc is the gap between the two vertebrae and the um, the mesh to mesh distance. So the distance between vertebrae one that would have been up here and vertebrae two has then been projected as this color map onto vertebra two, um, just to understand the compression that this disc undergoes um, dynamically throughout the test. Okay, so moving on to some, um, to a slightly uh, smaller uh, part here, the goal of this test, so we're looking at the analysis of the ligaments on the stability of the AC joint, which is also known as the uh, shoulder joint. So the, the goal of the test was essentially to measure the ligament and how stable it was, and then to start to, sorry, to measure the joint and how stable it was, and then to start to remove uh, ligaments and to see how each individual ligament affects the overall stability of the joint. Again, uh, reference points were applied to the soft tissue, uh, broken up into um, reference point components within the GOM software. And these red points at the bottom were used for motion compensation. And here's a video of the test. The, the sort of the shoulder part of this joint was attached to this uh, vet actuator, which applies a vertical translation. Um, and we can see the joint moving here. And these are the results. So each of these points has a vector arrow. The color and the length of the vector arrows is relative to the movement. But actually, these movements are a lot smaller than these vector arrows are making it appear. So they're really helping us to visualize quite small micro motions. And of course, we can plot the um, these vector arrows on a graph. So here we're just looking at global displacement taken into account uh, x, y, and z all in one uh, graph. So this, this point right here, of course, has uh, the highest levels of displacement, but we're still looking at sort of sub uh, millimeter displacements, um, whereas some of these points are just moving um, by less than 0.3 uh, millimeters per cycle. Okay, so moving away from the uh, the soft tissue examples, for anyone who felt a little bit uncomfortable looking at those, um, and moving towards uh, the testing the stiffness of a leg prosthesis. So we've got an athlete who's running on a treadmill. The athlete has this uh, new prosthesis design on that they wish to test, and the athlete's running at about six to ten uh, kilometers per hour. And the goal of the test is to derive the velar curve and to look at the displacements of the prosthesis um, throughout the test. And that way we can look at the stiffness um, of the prosthesis and whether the material is going to be able to uh, sort of survive multiple cycles of someone running with this prosthesis on. Uh, so here are the displacement results. We've talked about uh, rigid body motion compensation quite a lot today. Uh, so it's important to note that the points that are attached to the knee here are the ones that have been used for rigid body motion compensation. So we're looking at the displacements of the points 
on the blade relative to these points on the knee, as opposed to global displacements relative to the camera. So of course, the tip is experiencing the highest level of displacements, and it is experiencing displacements of up to 70 millimeters. So that's quite um, a significant displacement. And um, we've plotted these three points um, over time. So we've broken down the motion into the X, Y, and Z components, um, Z being uh, the smallest component, and Y being where the majority of the displacement takes place, uh, speci especially for this point uh, one. It was determined, the results of this test was that the amount of motion that this uh, blade design um, undergo during this uh, running motion did not really risk the durability of the component just because of the material that they'd used in the blade design was sort of designed to take this large level of displacement, which is good. Okay, so um, hopefully an application that not too many people are personally familiar with, um, but perhaps a few of you have experienced going to the dentist um, and it might put a few of you off um, your next trip. So we're going to talk a little bit about uh, dental implants. So specifically looking at the manufacture of artificial te teeth. So if a tooth is lost, then an implant is used to replace the root of the tooth and a crown is then used to cover the implant. So Rob's already introduced the ATOS uh, scanning system that we're um, that's been used in this test here. So the ATO system scans a mold. So this is a mold of someone's uh, like jaw. Uh, the ATO system scans the mold. Um, and in this image, we can see the fringe projection that the ATO system is using to perform the scan. And the, the goal here is to create a representative crown um, that best represents um, a sort of more natural human tooth. Um, so ATOS was used to help uh, reverse engineer the real tooth, and that way the crown would be as representative as possible. So on, on the left, we've got the scan of, um, of this mold here. And then the right hand side, we've zoomed into just the tooth that um, needs to be replaced, um, just so we can see sort of the level of detail uh, that's possible. So how close we can get this real tooth to look. And of course, these uh, dental implants need testing as well. Um, and that's where we can use um, Aramis and digital image correlation uh, to help us out there. So the implants and the tooth crowns must uh, with, withstand quite strong chewing forces. And of course, you if you do have a replacement tooth, you want it to last um, for the rest of your life, really, which is quite a long time. Imagine how many times you bite down on something in your life. It's quite a lot. Um, so the they want to test them before they um, before they sort of start putting them into people. Okay, so the um, these implants were inserted into a representative jaw um, with the crowns positioned on top, and then these two pistons are in place to provide sort of representative forces uh, to simulate the biting motion in the uh, jaw. And everything was speckled with this DIC um, speckle pattern, which enables us to do a full field digital image correlation um, on this component. And the results are really interesting. So we're looking at a strain in the Y direction. The blue areas are um, negative strain, which is compressive strain, which makes sense of, as, of course, these two pistons are applying um, a downward load. And then we've got the red area here, which is more of a tensile um, strain, of course, as the, as the pistons are pushing down on the implants, this area is under strain as well. So DIC was really useful in this application to um, look at the behavior of the inter interface between the bone and the implant. Okay, so moving on to our final biomedical example for today, and this is a hip implant. So 
looking at what um, a modern hip implant looks like these days and this is how they would test them so you've got a machine and the machine applies a load to the hip implant which would simulate the real loading conditions in the human body and the goal of this test was to val validate a numerical simulation or an FEA model. So Rob and I have mentioned this a, a couple of times now, so we just wanted to sort of talk through a few points of how optical metrology can be used to help um, validate and optimize FEA models. So for starters, we can use them to either generate or double check that the input geometry the mesh is correct. So we would be using uh, either a CT machine or an Atos 3D scanning system um, to double check this. RMS, of course, can be used to measure uh, material parameters, but it can also be used to measure the boundary conditions in the test. If we want to model or simulate the load um, within our FEA model, we want to sort of make sure that we can use RMS to check the direction that this load is being applied in and any other movements um, of other parts around the test. This is really useful, in, especially in large complex testing. And then we would create the test and use Aramis to measure the test in real life and hope that the Aramis measurements, so we can measure either the position, the shape, uh, the surface strains and displacements, or we can measure all of these during the test and hope that these tie up with our FEA model. If they don't, then we can feed the results back, um, hopefully optimize the FEA model to have one that works better going forwards. So what does this look like on our hip joint that we just had a look at? At the top, we've got the FEA model. Um, so we've got obviously the red area here is the highest level of strain and then um, down to much lower levels of strain uh, sort of on the shoulders here. And at the bottom, we've got our measured results from the DIC data. They're not a perfect match, but they definitely show the peak of strain in a similar position and uh, sort of this strain gradient um, throughout the part as well. So probably the FEA modelers were quite happy with these results. Um, let's hope that they were. OK, so I'd like to um, move on to a couple of sports equipment examples. I'd like to also thank our colleagues over at Trillion um, in the US for providing these examples for us. So the first one is a golf club um, impact study. The reference points that we've discussed were applied to the golf club head and also the golf ball. Um, these two parts were also scanned using an ATOS system so we can uh, visualize the movement of the meshes um, throughout the test. These two parts were then um, analyzed in six degrees of freedom. Uh, we've got the displacement, so displacement in X, Y and Z on the uh, left hand side graphs. And then the rotations in the um, X, Y and Z on the uh, right hand side graphs. So specifically, we can see the spin and the rotation that's been applied to the ball um, once it's been hit by the uh, putter head. This next example is a hockey stick deformation or deflection. So looking at how much the a hockey stick deflects when it hits a puck. Of course, hockey sticks are um, a lot more um, flexible, less rigid than golf clubs are. And so here we can see the deformations, but also they've managed to measure the um, vibrations of the hockey stick afterwards. Um, so rigid body motion has been applied to this, uh, to the handle of the hockey stick right here. And then uh, these displacements are relative to that handle. So we've got about 30 millimeters of displacement um, from the handle, which is quite nice. And a final example uh, looking at the high speed impact when a bullet hits a Kevlar uh, helmet. Uh, as this is a 3D example, two, um, two high speed cameras were required. Um, and you can see the timestamp at the bottom of the video um, there. So 
What was happening was when the bullet came and impacted the helmet, a very large amount of displacement was occurring uh, around the ear flap. And this was impacting um, into sort of the neck area of the soldier and causing almost as much damage as if uh, they got hit by a bullet, to be honest. So um, it wasn't really the ideal design for the helmets. So what they did, they used Aramis to um, measure the redesigned helmets just to check how they were uh, performing um, before they sent it out with any of their soldiers. So hopefully in this case, Aramis has also saved some lives. At the, at the start of our presentation, Rob uh, sort of uh, gave us some advantages of optical 3D metrology. So we just wanted to recap these. So hopefully the, they feel um, Hopefully you've got a bit more understanding of this since we've shown you um, how these might look across uh, the different examples. So of course, Aramis is a non-contact measurement. Uh, we're just using cameras to measure things. Uh, this means that we can measure things that are a lot more fragile and have a lot less uh, of an influence on the test. And it's also a high uh, precision measurement. So the micro motions on the AC joint and the uh, shoulder plates, um, but it's capable of measuring um, very small displacements like that. But we can also measure the long-term tests. Of course, human bodies are designed to last a very long time. Anything that goes into the human body is designed to last a long time as well. Um, so we, they need to be tested using fatigue tests under thousands and thousands of cycles. And this brings me on to the last point as well. We can handle complex measuring sequences. So um, with cyclic loading, people can trigger the ARMA system just to measure the loading points that they want to uh, measure as well. So a little bit more about uh, who GOM are as a company. So GOM is an optical 3D metrology um, company. Everything we do uses uh, cameras to measure, um, measure what our customers want to measure. Uh, we don't just supply the, the camera systems, we supply the software to do the analysis, as well as um, providing training for our customers and application advice as well. So um, as we didn't have um, that many visitors over lockdown, we put together a slide that's uh, like a little tour of the office. Um, so I can show you the systems that we've got at GOM UK in case anyone wanted to uh, visit. So we've got a range of different ATOS systems. So this is where we could use the uh, projected fringe patterns to um, measure a 3D scan of a part. And then we've got the ATOS scan box as well. So the ATOS scan box is uh, essentially we take an ATOS system and then we put it on a robot. And this allows us to measure things um, a lot quicker and a lot more repeatably as well. Um, so this is perfect for our customers who want to measure um, tens or hundreds of parts a day. And then the uh, bottom left, we've got the Aramis SRX. This is our high-end um, Aramis sensor. So this is a 3D sensor. We've got two cameras left and right. And at the moment, it's looking at a knee joint um, as an example part. And then the bottom right, we've got the, the GOM CTs. So this is the latest addition uh, to the GOM range. So this is a computed tomography um, system. It's one of the first uh, computer tomography systems really designed as a metrology system. So the goal here is that people can perform a gd &T and dimensional checks on their CT scans. So GOM was founded in 1990. Um, it's a German company, so our head offices are in Braunschweig in Germany, and all of the research and development and production goes on. Um, the new offices are great because they were purpose built for, um, for GOM with our sort of design and specifications. So we've got two floors of offices, majority of which have um, nice views out the windows, uh, customer greeting and training areas on the bottom floor production at the back. And then on the left here, there's a gym and plenty of car parking spaces for everyone as well. So since 1990, GOM's really grown to be um, a global metrology network. So we've got 60 sites worldwide who are GOM certified partners and eight of these or eight companies within the GOM group. Um, and that includes uh, GOM UK. 
Um, as we were discussing at the start, uh, just offline actually, GOM has relatively recently been acquired by Zeiss, who's a sort of a huge, um, a huge corporation. Of course, they are very strong within the medical technology segments. Um, so hopefully with uh, GOM and Zeiss now working together, this is something that we can sort of develop even more solutions for our customers. And GOM sits uh, right here under the Industrial Quality and uh, Research Group. If anyone is interested, here's a quick extract of uh, GOM's customers. Um, as you can see, they're sort of in a, a very wide range of different industries, but there are a few names that we've talked about today, such as Adidas, um, and of course, like Reebok and stuff are there too. Just Adidas had nicer looking trainers. Um, we've installed over 17,000 systems worldwide. So um, we really do have a lot of experience as a co company and we're installing more um, every week. If you've uh, got to the end of this webinar and you think, oh, this is really cool. I really wonder how I can sort of have a go myself. Uh, I really encourage you to download the GOM Correlate software. It's our free evaluation software. You can use it to do free 2D analysis of either point components or speckle patterns. Um, and you can share your results with your friends or your colleagues. So you can download this software um, from our website. And on our website, you can also um, join our, our webinars where we, I'm next week, I'm hosting a free online training session for our free GOM Correlate users just to um, make sure that everyone's sort of getting the best out of the software. Um, now, if you want to submit any questions, hopefully you can find the Q&A tab. Um, so I'd welcome you to submit questions and then Andrew's going to go through at the end. But while you're sort of thinking of your questions, I'll just play the uh, GOM Correlate Challenge video. So this was a video that's created, um, it's like an amalgamation of uh, different videos made by me, Rob and our colleagues all around the world. So during lockdown, we all made fun little videos where we use the GOM software to track us doing unusual things, our children on trampolines or bouncy balls. Um, and we just made uh, fun videos to sort of keep everyone entertained uh, over LinkedIn. This one's great. It's just a bunny rabbit jumping down uh, just to show people what they could do with the GOM Correlate software. Most of these videos are filmed with an iPhone. My dad filmed this one, so you really don't have to be um, an expert at DIC to do it. Um, and so hopefully this sort of gives you a, a few fun ideas of what, what can be done. Um, as well as the a lot more serious applications that Rob and I have discussed. If anyone is particularly interested, um, I'll show a slide in a second, but Rob can also put into the chat box perhaps. Um, Rob and I both have sort of GOM email addresses where you can contact us if you're if you're interested in more information about anything we've discussed today. Um, So here's our, our email addresses. Um, and I think Andrew's going to host the Q&A. So don't be shy, put your questions into the uh, Q&A question box. Thank you very much, Amy and Rob. Very interesting presentation. So I'd like to just ask Andy to start with the questions. I personally have quite a few questions, but I will wait and ask them after uh, Andy asks the other questions. I'm, I'm sure, Ashkan, you have millions of questions in your mind. Well, uh, let me say thank you very much, uh, Rob and Amy, for this uh, um, very informative and certainly impressive presentations. I don't know about anybody else, but I really enjoyed them. Um, a couple of questions here. Um, it's a good one. Excellent. How would, uh, how would the described technology be used for developing equipment, for instance, shoes, to be used for astronauts in low gravity deployment, such as to be found on the moon and Mars? Yeah, sure, I, I can answer that one. So yeah, great, great question. Um, one of the nice things about Aramis is it can be applied to any wide range of, uh, of applications, as long as you can test it and you can see it being tested with the cameras and we can measure it. Um, specifically, they're talking about the, um, the use of shoes for astronauts. Um, I guess it's very similar to the, the Adidas applications there. They're looking for comfort of a, a running shoe and performance. 
Um, there's going to be similar requirements, especially if you're thinking about Mars. Um, it's potentially potentially a long way to Mars, so you're going to be in the uh, in the clothing or the shoes for a long time. So not only has it got to function properly, it's also got to be comfort. So it goes back to really understanding um, really how skin moves, I guess, and the strains in the in bare skin. Um, and replicating those movements within clothes. They're not just having a, a normal sort of polo shirt or something like this, but something that would move dynamically or move in, in more modern ways. So different fits and different cuts, I would imagine. Um, but in terms of how you test that or how you recreate zero G, um, hopefully you've got some more ideas on that. But as long as you can test it and we can see it, then uh, yeah, we can, we can make a good measurement for it, but yeah. Interesting question. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rob. Um, another good one from Peter James. You stated that you are able to measure very small deplacements or accurate shapes. Can you please give an idea as to what range the accuracy is in? Is it within single figure micron accuracy or tens of microns? Thank you. So with um, a couple of microns or tens of microns. Yeah, sure. I'll, I'll answer that. So because the technology is um, based on using cameras, the accuracy of the system really sort of scales with the volume that you want to measure. So the example that we like to give is if you are measuring something with a one meter measuring volume, you can expect to have, a, you know, an uncertainty on each point of about um, 10 microns. So if we scale this down and look at some, a lot of the applications we were looking at today were probably less than 100 millimeters in size. So we're looking at about one micron uh, accuracy range uh, per measurement point there. So. That sounds very good. Yeah. That sounds very good, thank you. Accurate enough is normally the answer. <laughs> Well, again, what we, uh, as in engineering, we want to, to know uh, figure numbers, you see microns, how many microns, these sort of things. But I, I'm sure it's, uh, it's accurate enough for, for the purpose. Thank you for the answer, uh, Amy. Um, another one, oh, it's a good one. Very, very impressive presentation. That's, a, I'd say, uh, a remark. The Alliance with Zeiss is a big event for, the, for this technology. That's a statement. Is the system performing based on stereo images alone one question, have you considered using multiple cameras? And a third one, GOM system compared to multi-channel laser vibrometers. Any comments on that? Yeah, sure, I can answer that one. So um, yeah, obviously the Alliance with Zeiss is only good for uh, the future of this technology. Um, in terms of stereo images, yeah, I think everything we showed today was, you're correct, so just stereo images, so images from two cameras. Um, we can do multi, uh, camera measurements as well. So uh, if you imagine going back to the running shoe application, if you imagine you have um, a pair of cameras on one side of the foot or the shoe, one on the other side, one above, one below, if you have a glass force plate, one on the back looking at the heel, one at the, the top looking at the toe section, you can combine data from lots of uh, cameras. So um, yeah, although we can't show the data, in fact, the uh, the most cameras I've seen used on one single Aramis test was 12. Mm -hmm. And the ultimate application of this was measurement um, of, a, of a, a running shoe and a running foot. So complete 360 coverage. So yeah, um, definitely possible. Uh, and the final part of that was multi-channel laser vibrometers. So I guess the, the main difference between um, a laser vibrometer, if I understand the question correctly, and the GOM system is that with the GOM system, because we're taking an image, we're getting all of the points at one snapshot in time. So um, we then rely on the speed of the cameras. For example, cameras these days can go up to hundreds of thousands of frames per second. So we can acquire data at that very high rate. Whereas a laser vibrometer um, potentially could go higher in frequency, but only at a single point or you would need multiple laser vibrometers. So for example, I don't know if we mentioned it, but um, our full field application, you could easily have um, 10,000 data points um, creating the color maps that we show. So um, yeah, there's obviously different systems for different applications and those two main things, so the, the speed and 
the um, the number of data points or data channels would be the main differences between DIC or, uh, and the laser vibrometers. Okay, Bob, it's, it sounds good to me. Thank you very much. Um, Chris from Chris, the Adidas shoe pattern looks similar to the camouflaged pattern of new cars being tested on the roads before launch. Could you use DIC to extract detailed, detailed deformation data of the car body panels as it drove past? Um, yeah, so I'll, I'll take that question. Um, so obviously being based in Coventry, we're very close to uh, Jaguar Land Rover. So we do see quite a lot of these cars, both on the road and um, when we go and visit Jaguar Land Rover. And we always sort of look at them and think, yeah, we could definitely measure the, the deformation of the car as it drives past with Aramis. Um, so we always sort of wonder why that's the pattern they choose, but it's, yeah. It is a we, good pattern for DIC. And, yeah, yeah, it's perfect, it, isn't it? I think we've we've measured it, it, haven't we? Yeah. <laughs> we probably shouldn't tell anyone that. <laughs> the same, <laughs> not mentioning the names, but maybe a little bit too late, but certain car companies um, have used that same pattern. So they have a whole department aimed at wrapping the cars um, to camouflage them. They can print this same, um, same pattern and they can use it for deflection measurement. Um, the only sort of thing you need to go careful on is that when you're talking about measuring surface strain, you're not measuring the strain in between the, um, the sticky back plastic and the, the door panel. Um, so it's better for deflection measurements rather than strain as such. But yeah, it's definitely a, a familiar pattern. But there's lots yes, of yeah. patterns in nature we can use. Thank you, Amy, and thank you, Rob. Uh, I think it satisfies uh, uh, the question. I think uh, that's the four questions we have had so far. Unless anybody else would like to uh, to put in some more, perhaps uh, Ashkan, you want to have your questions, please answered. I see. Just there is another comment in the chat box. I'm not sure if this is a question. So it says, um, I don't know, Rob, Amy, can you see this question? Yeah, I can see this. I, I can read it and answer it if you want. So um, the comment in the chat just says, uh, I think it's from Martin. It says, are the vertebrae one to five that Amy was showing uh, representing L1 to L5? So yeah, um, these these five vertebrae that Amy showed um, are equivalent to the, the five lumbar vertebrae. So yeah, easy answer there. Great. Any so other questions? Let's know. Any more questions from Yoshka? No? Yes, I have a few questions. So go on, go on. Um, have you tried measuring this on a transparent surface? Yep, so on the running shoe, definitely. So um, uh, if you've ever seen any um, low or force plates for testing of running shoes and um, those sorts of things, many of them now have uh, transparent or glass uh, mm. floors. So we can have cameras underneath looking up um, at the underside. Um, we do have some images. We, we have lots of different images we can show, but I guess maybe we missed out the ones for the underneath. But mm. yeah, understanding the contact force is very important um, for, for things, not just uh, running shoes, but yeah, you can see the glass yeah. plate there in the image. Yeah. So there's, uh, there's cameras underneath that glass plate. Yeah. So um, if the measurement surface is, let's say, a bi biological tissue, which is transparent, mm -hmm. um, I would imagine you would need to put some uh, speckles or some pattern on top of it to be able to track. Is that correct? Yeah, exactly. So we're looking for the contrast. So, um, yeah. I mean, even if you imagine a, an automotive sheet metal panel, um, it, it could be very shiny. So we would typically, or a materials tensile coupon, we would typically apply a white background and speckle the black on top. Um, in this case, Amy's got on screen, obviously the trainers will white to start with, you just speckle some black on. But the same would be with tissue. So you would, I mean, typically for tissues, um, we would, especially if it's a wet tissue, we would keep it wet, drain it down at the last minute, and then apply the, the pattern typically with powder-based um, paints or sprays, um, sort of chalk-based spray to create the white background and then some black powder-based um, speckled on. But it's a matter of seconds to apply this pattern. Is there any other technique apart from applying the paint? Because I've heard in biomechanics, some say, um, putting on a spray paint may affect, affect the uh, biomechanics or the behavior of the tissue. Um, so is there like any other technique that you've came across? Yeah, so essentially we just, we do need that, that contrast between the black and the white. So sometimes um, for certain materials, 
certain tissues, especially if they're, if they're not wet and they're not shiny, um, and then maybe a light color naturally anyway, just speckling a little bit of black on top is enough. So you're not mm -hmm. applying a lot of um, paint or a lot of powder. Um, but I mean, typically compared to sticking a strain gauge on onto a, a section of tissue, then this is uh, um, mm -hmm. certainly one step better than that. But yeah, for sure, there's, there's lots of different ways of creating patterns and different techniques. So, so in, um, in one of the videos you showed that you had um, like a 3D simulations of probably a CT scan of, um, I think it was a spine and it was showing the deformation. So the CT scan was measured um, from uh, one of your devices as well, I would imagine. Um, I think my question is that, is the device, if, is your software able to uh, match the geometry with the deformation live or has it done in, with a separate software like an FE model or FE simulation? Um, so the so the example we showed was a spine. I believe this was measured with a different CT um, a different CT device. Uh, actually, ours um, has quite a small measurement volume, and I don't think ours was quite developed yet when um, we did this mm -hmm. this application. Um, so your question is how how did we sort of see the the deformation of the CT? models so actually the spine parts the you know the bone parts of the spine have been modeled as um as rigid and it's the the bits that are moving in this test is the tissue in between uh, so we've assumed uh, that the the bones are are rigid and are moving rigidly with the pins that were applied um into the bones okay so when we measure the um the dis like the displacements of those two uh, two sections. It's how they're moving, how the pins are moving, and and then the scans are then tacked it within the software to the to the um, to the bones to the the meshes of the bones. So it's possible to import um, a wide range of different uh, things into the Aramis software. So we can import. Uh, CAD models, meshes, mm -hmm. um, and as long as you have a way to align them, so we would have done some sort of uh, best fit alignment or three point alignment to the points, um, then it's possible to import like a wide range of different things into the Aramis software, such as FE models or mm -hmm. uh, thermal camera data as well. So, are you able to uh, use the DIC, uh, one of your one of your DIC devices, using two camera and get a rough estimation of the surface geometry? Uh, yeah, so all of our all of the data that we sort of capture is is three D data. So if there is um, any deformations or on the surface, then we can see we can see that within within the software. Um, so we do have a three D surface uh, mesh made up of the DIC points. You could say. Um, so you know when you you look at round material samples, uh, you can see the the curvature quite a lot. Um, and obviously it's got its limits. The two cameras have to see that part of the surface and a speckle pattern has to be applied as well. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Fundamentally though, it is measuring the shape, but if you're just interested in the shape, then the, the Atos structured light systems that we, we do will get you a much um, much better resolution, both in terms of accuracy and, uh, and uh, point spacing, if you just are interested in the shape of a static object. The benefits of Aramis is tracking the movement and dynamic shape more than static. I see, just my last question. Uh, so <laughs> let's say if you have um, a ball, roughly 25 millimeter diameter of this ball, how many cameras would you need um, to monitor the deformation in 3D for the whole sphere? Yes, yeah, so maybe I could answer that. So there's two different approaches that you can do. So um, the if you did want to monitor it all the way around from 360, so I mean, we've done tests on not Coke cans, but crush tests on um, on other sort of cylindrical panels or cylindrical sections, typically you would need eight cameras. So four pairs of cameras to get a complete 360 view um, around a, a, a cylindrical object. It'd be similar for the ball. The other thing you could do um, with the ball is, if you're assuming that the ball is um, solid, so we do this if you think of pedestrian head impact testing in, uh, in car crash, 
So we can just track the, the movement and the six degree of freedom rotation of the head as it impacts the bonnet, for example. We can track that just from one side. All we need to do there is do a pre-measurement. So these points that we put on the object, um, I've got a little ball here, that'll work. We put the points all the way around and then we pre-measure them um, to start with. So we know where all the points all the way around the ball are. So then when we're just viewing from one fixed direction, it doesn't matter what orientation that ball is moving in, we always, we can recognize it. Um, so that's probably a cheaper way. So if you're doing it, because you only need the two cameras. Um, so if, it is, if it is on a biological tissue, would yeah. you be able to put uh, speckles in a way that, uh, let's say a wet biological tissue, would you put the speckles in a way that you can track them in advance? Um, it becomes harder then, certainly with a wet tissue, just purely from the time side of it. Um, but depending on how long you could, you could keep it out of fluid then yeah yeah possible because one of the downsides of optical is we need to be able to see it so while we can look into chambers um typically those chambers are filled with air um it is possible to do some looking into water filled chamber but as you can imagine that um, the optics distort and change a lot when you're looking into water um, so looking into air chambers for temperature or wind tunnels is is easier than looking into a, a fluid chamber, either for medical or we also get similar questions on um, uh, corrosion examples as well. So looking into water chambers for that. But. Great, thank you very much. I see there are a few more questions. Uh, yeah, a few more questions here. Uh, one from KISS again, which perhaps uh, has been answered. But again, let me just read it out. Have you looked at deformation of a running shoe sole from below with a transparent running track? I think that was covered in your question, was it? Yeah, yeah, we looked at we we, yeah. we looked at that. Um, so I, that I was... hope that uh, Chris is happy with the answer. What you? Yeah, I'm sure gave. he is. He's asked more questions. <laughs> All right, okay then. Uh, some uh, more here uh, from Peter. Apologies for the for the further question, no problem at all. But I heard you mention the word shiny. Is a shiny component impossible to measure using this te technology, or just challenging? Is there a level of ref reflec sorry, reflectivity whereby the system becomes unusable as a technology option? Yeah, I can, I can answer that one. So um, in the speckle patterns that we see, so for example, the ones that are on the, um, the screen there, we don't want there to be any reflections, if we're honest, especially for, um, for these two camera measurements, because a reflection, if you look at a reflection um, of a mirror or um, the sun shining, it will look different if you move your head to two different sides. So from two different angles, that reflection will be in a different place. So the idea of that speckle pattern, if you had a shiny object, um, is that you would apply some white paint on the background to deaden those reflections, and then the black would be speckled on top of it. Um, we typically always apply a pattern to an object anyway, just to get the best, best data out of it. So, yeah. So it's uh, this system uh, never becomes unusable as a technology. Yeah. So as long as you can apply a pattern to it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's okay. All right then. Yeah. Another one from Chris here. How far could you push this technique in measuring the behavior of rowing or canoe blades underwater? Mm -hmm. What would the effect of water be on measurements? Very, very tricky question. I think I kind of talked about that one as well. So yeah, measuring yeah. there is, is one thing. Yeah, measuring through water is more challenging. It, it's easier if the water is stable, um, if the water is moving like during a row in a canoe. Um, yeah, that's, that's really difficult um, to make a measurement there, certainly. One thing you could do is you could look to measure it from the outside maybe, um, but you would assume there that the blade would um, remain stiff, which I guess it doesn't. So, yeah, I not, see, right. Not so suitable for that specific application. That's all right. Maybe one day. Okay, thank you. Anything to add to that, Amy? Is it okay? No, I'm just yeah. smiling at Chris's oh. next question, to be honest. All right. Like Chris's next question is, it would be interesting to see a comparison between a novice and expert and an expert climber. Yeah, what do you want to measure, Chris? I'll make a LinkedIn video. I'm going to the climbing wall tonight. <laughs> or is that a, uh, a volunteer for a novice? Like <laughs> definitely not an expert <laughs> maybe nick will uh, offer to film and be uh we've i've got a, a two, just a 2d video of um 
my my partner doing a pull up um and the strains on his skin while he did a pull up and that's that's quite interesting to see sort of which muscles are being utilized uh, the most in that um so, so it's the sort of motion that can be measured uh, for sure just maybe takes a little bit longer to set up um to so very likely there is difference between a novice and an expert client yeah there's a, a lot of differences i would say yeah. yeah sure yeah yeah okay that's fine good question again another one from chris um uh, another two has i think has it been used to train operators in the most efficient motion path to improve skills yeah maybe i could say that one um essentially yeah as long as we can measure the movement of the person then we can analyze that and work out which is good or bad as long as you can put a criteria to it one thing that springs to mind is in um measurements of um, implants for um, hip implants. So you, there we, we measure the, the tools and measure the operator or the surgeon and how their movements um, perform. So you can put a number to that to, uh, yeah, to essentially do what you said there. So to train them or to improve their, their All right, yeah. And I think uh, that's, that wasn't the full question. There is a second Mm. section of the question to improve skill expert use of full body best efficiency smooth motion of center of mass i believe it's double s yeah so um again having the ability to put numbers to it and, and compare it so uh, if you have an outcome that is good and an outcome that is bad you can film the two and and see what's uh, what's causing that essentially so, okay um I mean, it can be used for anything, not just um, uh, movements of people. For example, we had a um, an example where we were looking at comparisons of a, it's a an automotive application, but a welding scene. Um, the robot welder welded it in a certain particular way. Um, it had, to simplify, it went from left to right. The manual person, when he's welding the same structure, went from right to left. And we could then do the strain measurement on the back side of the, the weld, it was a T weld, and we could see that the um, the manual one applied some uh, compressive strain, whereas the automated one applied some uh, some tensile strain. So you're putting in different residuals there. So yeah, you could use it to look at the strain as well to understand different processes and why they are different. Different. Yes. Yeah. Okay. I think that was all the questions. And if I may have one, just one. Um, it's about uh, optical metrology, three dimensional in uh, six degrees of freedom. Mechanical bodies are after all, it's mechanical bodies. Um, if I remember well, you use some strain gauges um, to measure the strain, stress of strains. Um, can, you, can you separate the strains and stress in, uh, in all six degrees of freedom, which means along the three axes, linear axes, X, Y, Z, mm -hmm. and the three uh, rotational or torsional axes? So which means, can you measure torsional strains as well? Yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, on the surface, we can measure yeah, strains in, in any direction, and we can obviously break those down in the defined, um, the defined directions as well. All right, okay. And uh, the same gauges, those are, well, it's, it's a 2D um, sort of device. It measures in one way mm -hmm. along a linear direction, or if it's double, uh, uh, normal to that as well. Um, how many, well, the same gauge, perhaps you have to, to place a number of same gauges there uh, to, um, to establish uh, all these strains in the six, along the six degrees of freedom. Uh, how, how can you find the locations for the best optimum solution? Yeah, so obviously with the strain gauge, yeah, you're measuring in a single direction, same with an LVDT. One single transducer is measuring just in one direction. Mm -hmm. And with the strain gauge, for example, a strain gauge rosette would allow you to measure in all, all directions. And yeah. you can do similar with an LVDT. The, the benefit of uh, this sort of optical technique is that um, you don't need to do that. Every measuring point is 3D. So every one of those stochastic um, points you're getting um, information in 3D. So, um, yeah, that's just an added benefit. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Rob. Well, from Chris for Vorol, it's uh, just a comment. Excellent presentation. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for your comment. And for Mark, 
how does the process break down over time, set up, measure, and image processing analysis? Um, Pros process breakdown over time, setting up, measuring, image processing analysis. Yeah, sure. So I can I can take that. So one of the things that GOM sort of worked on is to basically reduce um, the not only the setup time required for uh, DIC measurements, but also the the expertise um, that's required. So most of the GOM systems are essentially designed to be used by um, not an untrained operator. Of course, they still have their, their GOM training, but, you know, they don't also have to be a highly skilled operator. So we're utilizing uh, systems that look something like mm -hmm. um, the the one in the image here. So this is the Aramis 3D camera. Everything in this is preset. The lenses are pre-set um, up and everything's sort of a mechanical adjustment. If they want to change to different lenses, they can just unscrew these and screw the next ones in. So as a in terms of actual setup time, of course, uh, if you have to get it out of a car or out of a cupboard, it's just the time it takes to set it up on a tripod and to plug it in. Uh, then you would uh, calibrate the sensor. Um, and then the other great thing about the 3D camera is it's uh, the very stable sensor too. So you don't have to calibrate um, every time you use it. Some of our customers just calibrate once a week. Um, that's maybe five minutes. And then the we would prepare the measurements, so either applying the speckle pattern, uh, probably another five minutes or, you know, 20 minutes if we have to wait for the paint to dry. Um, and then the measurement just simply takes as long as the as the test takes to do. Um, image processing, you've got uh, a couple of minutes there. It depends. It depends how many images you capture during the test, to be honest. Um, and then you've got the the analysis. So within the GOM software, we've built in some automated analysis for our customers, meaning that once you've done the analysis for a test once, you can use our template structure. Um, and then every, each additional test, the analysis is essentially um, done for you. You just need to get it to recalculate. Uh, so we've really tried to sort of minimize uh, the total time it takes to do all of those things. So hopefully that that answers your uh, question. I, I'm sure I'm sure it does. I'm sure it does. Well, thank you very much, Amy, for for the answer. And I think that concludes uh, the question answer session. So I'd like to hand it back to to you, Ashka. Thank you, Andy. So at the end, I just want to thank everyone for attending this presentation. I hope you all enjoyed it. If you would like to. Um, Join us in Biomedical Engineering Group. Please drop us an email and we can provide you more information. Thank you, Rob and Amy, for this excellent presentation. I personally really enjoyed it. And Andy, thank you very much for helping to organize this session. So if anyone has any last words to say, we can do this. Otherwise, we can leave. Well, I have, uh, we have a, uh, a couple of sentences in uh, actually in uh, the chat box from Peter James to all the panelists. I'd like to read it out if you don't mind. Sure. Many thanks to the presenters. It was very informative and greatly appreciated. I'm currently working with MTC Coventry on measurement and evaluation, and the GOM system is being looked at with great interest. That's a good thing, isn't it? So. Uh, yeah. Yep, the FTC, for those that don't know, is the Manufacturing Technology Centre. So it's one of the uh, government high value manufacturing catapult centres. Yes. Thank you very much for the comments. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Okay. okay. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. I really appreciate Rob and, uh, and Amy for, uh, for your time and for this ex for excellent presentation. I really enjoy that. Yeah, and, it was a, yeah, a pleasure. I, I, like, I like to come back to you uh, after, after, in a few days' time, perhaps, early next week, perhaps with other, other things. Okay, thank you. Thank you all. Bye-bye now. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Bye. Bye.